Hello my friends and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 build guide. I hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to be covering my pick for one of the very best main character builds in Baldur's Gate 3. This is a personal favorite of mine and a character that I have used multiple times over in my own runs and in my honor mode runs as well. And I think this character is going to be an incredibly strong pick for your main character because you get excellent access to dialogue skills, some of the very best in the game. You get some of the highest damage output in the game with weapon attacks, and you also get access to, at very high DCs, basically all of the very best spells in the game. So you can pretty much do everything. You will cover almost all of the offensive power that you need for your party, and the only thing that your party will need to cover for you is a little bit of defensive capabilities just to make sure that this character stays alive, because otherwise it's going to solo the encounters all on its own. The character I'm talking about, of course, is the Bardlock, which gets great damage, great spell access, as well as access to some of the most broken item combos in the game. Uh, item combos which are so powerful that I personally refuse to use them entirely because they trivialize basically at every encounter in the game. Well, We'll talk about those later, but this character is optimally suited to use some of the very best items in the game as well. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Liesl Strick for the two euro donation, and Rhythm Deb, Jules, and Larry Sherman for becoming channel members. Thank you so much, my friends. I really do appreciate it. And, and let me know if I mispronounced any of those names so I can say them right next time. Uh, really means a lot. Thank you so much. For this character, I am using Will as the example character, both because I think human is actually a pretty good pick for your racial option for this character, but also because I think this perfectly fits Will's lore. One, it's a warlock build, and he's a warlock, um, but also this character is going to be a swashbuckling melee fighter who will fight with a, a one-handed weapon, just as we see Will in his intro, so I think this character is an ideal pick for a lore-friendly Will build, if that's what you're looking for, or especially for an origin character, character run as Will, playing as Will as your main character, because this is a great main character build, and I think perfectly fits Will's background and lore as well, as well as of course being an extremely powerful build. If you're building this for a custom character, I recommend taking Half Drow as your racial option, because the extra cast of Darkness and Shield Proficiency are extremely useful, um, although Githyanki is always a good choice for uh, characters like this as well, for the extra mobility and the for the extra mobility from your racial spells, as well as the ability to just gain proficiency in every intelligence skill, which is extremely useful for dialogue characters, since intelligence skills are almost all used in dialogue, or the normal very strong races are all powerful as well. Half Wood Elf gets you the additional move speed and shield proficiency. Uh, Dwergar lets you remain permanently invisible outside of combat, and Halfling lets you reroll ones. All excellent choices here. For our first level, we're actually not going to take Warlock, we're going to take Bard, because you get much better skill access this way, and this will allow us to gain all of the dialogue skills we need right from the beginning. But first, we have to fix our character's uh, terrible starting stats, so let's go ahead and do that. We are going to begin with 17 Charisma, because we will be taking the Actor feat later to get even better dialogue skills, and so this will let us reach 18 with only the single point invested, and so that's always excellent. 16 constitution. One of the downsides of this character is that you will have relatively low hit points for a melee character, since you're taking levels in Warlock and Bard, and so having 16 constitution is even more important for this character than for other characters, although it's often, it's basically correct for every single character, um, but that will help mitigate one of the very few downsides of this character, and 10 wisdom just because it's the most important saving throw. For our skill selection, we are going to take uh, the only important thing here is to make sure that we don't take Deception or Performance, since we'll be getting those for free from the Actor feat later. Although if you want to use these in the early game, you could take a skill selection that uh, picks those up, and then respec into uh, to remove them once we get Actor. When you take Actor, it gives you expertise in those skills, so you don't actually need proficiency in them to have them. It just gets you two extra free skill points. I'm going to recommend spending those on Sleight of Hand and Stealth. Stealth will actually be pretty useful for this character later on, um, and Sleight of Hand will allow you to be a backup lock picker or your main lock picker if you don't have another dexterity-based character, though if you do, you could spend that point on Perception instead. Starting instrument is very important, so don't get this wrong. We all know what the right choice is, so just make sure you pick that one. And we are going to go with, for our cantrip selection, um, we're going to pick up 
vicious mockery, not because it's going to be a main component of our damage now, but because it's extremely powerful with a specific item combo later down the line, and so having access to it is going to be very important. And we are going to take friends, because this will let us get advantage on key persuasion checks. You will also want to have access to Minor Illusion somewhere in your party, so if, you're, if the rest of your party doesn't have Minor Illusion, then this character could take it over friends. It's very important to have this somewhere, but only one character needs to have it. For our spell selection, we are going to begin with uh, Healing Word, extremely important to take on every character, Dissonant Whispers, which is your best combat option for the early levels, and just a great CC and damage spell, um, and then for your remaining spells, you are going to want Long Strider if you don't have access to it anywhere else in your party. Uh, it is extremely important, again, that one character has access to Long Strider somewhere in your party. This spell is a ritual, even though it doesn't say so in the tooltip, so it doesn't take a spell slot to use and just gives your entire party 10 feet extra of move speed for the entire game, uh, as long as you cast it every day, which is, of course, extremely powerful, so it's resource-free and ridiculously strong. And and then for our last spell, I usually just take Speak with Animals, just because I really like having this and don't want to keep track of having to drink a potion every day. But you can also take Thunder Wave, because it's a great emergency option, Fairy Fire to help you reveal invisible creatures, or Tasha's Hideous Laughter if you feel like you need more control for single enemies, though usually Dissonant Whispers paralyzing enemies in place will be more than enough control at these early levels. That's it for level 1, let's level up. At character level 2, we're going to take our first Warlock level. This gets us much better combat options early, Eldritch Blast being an incredibly powerful combat spell early in the game, um, giving us a great ranged option that's going to stay with us for the rest of the game. At this point, we're going to play mostly as a ranged character, using our powerful spells from Warlock and our powerful, uh, or our powerful combat options from Warlock and our powerful spells from Bard, as well as our great supporting options to be a powerful ranged spellcaster at this point in the game, and then later on we'll transition to being more of a melee fighter as we go down the line. For our Warlock subclass, I think there are two options here. You could take the Great Old One, which lets you get a lot of free critical hits, or free fears when you critically hit enemies. This character will be making tons of attacks per round, and so this ability will go off very frequently. Or you could take the Fiend, and I'm going to recommend taking the Fiend for two reasons. One, the ability to gain temporary hit points, though it may seem minor, is actually uh, very useful to this character. You'll be killing a lot of enemies, since you do so much damage in the later game, and so you'll be triggering this basically every single turn, and those temporary hit points do add up, especially when combined with defensive options like Blade Ward or other forms of damage reduction. Um, as well, taking the Fiend gets you access to one of the very best spells in the entire game, Command. Command allows you to, with basically no questions asked, remove one enemy from combat. If they fail the save, they just skip their turn, uh, and it levels up extremely well, so as we get higher level spell slots, our, we will be freely upcasting this with our Warlock spells to take several enemies down in a single turn. As well, this is an enchantment spell, which is going to be extremely relevant for certain items later on. You'll notice many of the spells that we've picked so far are illusion or enchantment spells. This is because of the Ring of the Mystic Scoundrel, which is a, a great item to pick up for this character. For our second spell, at this level we're just going to take Hex. Later on we may swap Hex out because we'll have better things to concentrate on, but this is going to be a huge portion of our damage at this early stage of the game, so it's great to have Hex right now. For our cantrip selection, of course, we take Eldritch Blast, and then for our second one, we're going to take Blade Ward. Blade Ward allows us to protect the temporary hit points we're getting from Fiend, and later on will allow us to protect temporary hit points we get from Armor of Agathis. Don't cast Blade Ward in combat, either cast it before combat starts, or cast it specifically when you're trying to protect Armor of Agathis hit points, or if your character's in a horrible position and, and just needs to survive a round of attacks. This is an inefficient cantrip to use as a mainstay during combat, but a great option to have, and there really aren't a lot of other powerful options for your Warlock cantrips anyways, so it's great to be able to pick this up and use it when it comes up. At Warlock level 3, or at character level 3, we take our second level of Warlock, and we get to start taking 
Eld uh, Eldritch Invocations. Like basically every other Warlock character that has ever been made, uh, we are going to take Agonizing Blast and Devil Sight as our first two invocations. Agonizing Blast gives us an incredible ranged option, allowing us to add our Charisma to our Eldritch Blast when combined with Hex. This is some of the best damage output in the game. In fact, an Agonizing Blast Eldritch Blast... Uh, an Agonizing Blast, Eldritch Blast Warlock with Hex is kind of the baseline for good damage dealer in the early game. If your damage dealers are dealing more damage than that setup, you are going to be uh, very happy. And if they're doing less damage than that setup, then you probably need to try to increase it. Because this is the default damage for a damage dealer and is just a great way to... Re to DPS down enemies, one of the best damage setups in the game involves this. Devil Sight we're taking because, of course, when we get Darkness, we are going to be able to, or if we're half drow, we already have access to it, or we'll get access to it at level 5. Um, when we get Darkness, this will allow us to see normally in it, which lets us set up areas of complete invulnerability to enemy ranged fire while gaining advantage on all of our attacks. When we're in melee combat as well, the enemies will be blinded themselves and have disadvantage, giving us advantage on our attacks and disadvantage on enemy attacks, which is an enormous ad uh, advantage in combat, of course. For our remaining spell here, we're going to pick up Armor of Agathis. Like I talked about, this is useful to protect with, uh, because it combines very well with Blade Ward to give you additional damage, and it's double value when you're protecting the health with Blade Ward. Um, you also get to return damage if enemies get into combat, and this helps keep you alive while being relatively squishy. This is also a way to convert a short rest resource, a Warlock spell slot, which comes back on a short rest, into something that lasts all day and therefore gives you a benefit for the entire long rest. At Warlock level 3, we select our Pact Boon, and the Pact that we are going to take is the Pact of the Blade. This allows us to bind a Pact Weapon, letting it use our Charisma for to hit, um, for its to hit and damage rolls, rather than our Strength or Dexterity. This obviously is awesome because it means that our spells and our weapon attacks key off of the same stat, so we only have to raise one stat uh, really high, and this lets us be both a damage dealer and a powerful spellcaster combined into a single character. We do need to remember to actually bind the weapon. It's very easy to forget to do this, and I do often get comments when I post blade packed warlocks of people whose blade pack blade packed weapons aren't working. Remember, you have to actually cast this when you equip the weapon you want to be your blade uh, your blade packed weapon, and then it will use your charisma to attack. For our level 2 spell selection, of course we're going to take Darkness, and we could replace a spell here, so we'll almost always be concentrating on Darkness in fights at this point, so we could replace Hex um, starting now. I would, l I generally like to replace a spell next level, rather than re or replace Hex next level, rather than replace it this level, but we could immediately replace it with Misty Step if we wanted to and that will give us access to better mobility. That's a call that you kind of have to make depending on whether you feel like your character is out of, you know, in danger a lot and needs the extra mobility or whether you need the extra ranged damage. More um and that will de that will depend a little bit on just how your your fights have played out so far. So I would make that call based on your experience of playing the character. At Warlock level 4, we are going to take the Actor feat. This gives us expertise in deception and performance, which also gives us uh, proficiency in both of those skills, which is, of course, excellent, and um, giving us two extra skills for free, and giving us very, very strong skill checks in both of those skills, as well as bumping our Charisma up to 18. This means we're now adding plus 4 to hit and damage on our weapon attacks and our Eldritch Blast attacks, and is great as a result. For our cantrip, if we still don't have access to Minor Illusion, we definitely need it. If you do have access to Minor Illusion, you can pick up Mage Hand. It's also very useful to have access to Bone Chill, because preventing some enemies from healing in the late game is quite useful. And around this level, you're going to start fighting a lot of undeads, uh, and being able to give them disadvantage with Bone Chill is pretty nice as well. You'll still almost always be using Eldritch Blast, but Bone Chill does have some utility if you don't need Minor Illusion or, or the other spells. For our spell selection here, you probably want to take Cloud of Daggers. This is just an excellent way to remove an enemy, uh, to do damage that does not require a saving throw at all, and keeping enemies 
trapped in a cloud of daggers is one of the most efficient damage sources. This gives your character a lot of AoE damage, something it was previously lacking as well, which can be very useful in certain encounters. At level 5, we get to pick up another Eldritch Invocation, which... Uh, there are two choices here. One is Repelling Blast, which lets you push enemies. Being able to push enemies with your Eldritch Blast is really powerful for this character, because you can push them into your Hunger of Hadar, or your Cloud of Daggers, or uh, just away from you if you need to disengage for whatever reason. And so that's a very strong default. Although, if you do want to use specifically a robe, you could pick up the... Mage Armor upgrade, Armor of Shadows, which lets you set your AC to 13. I would recommend just getting Mage Armor from um, an ally if you're doing that, rather than having to take the Invocation. And Repelling Blast is an excellent Invocation, especially since they fixed it in Patch 6 and you can now turn it off. For our spell selection, we're going to take Hunger of Hadar, one of the premier reasons to be a Warlock at all. The spell is incredible and extremely crippling to enemies. And now since we have this spell that we really want to be concentrating on, we can replace Cloud of Daggers. Um, since we're almost always will prefer to concentrate on Hunger of Hadar to concentrate on Cloud of Daggers in fights, uh, we can replace that with Counter Spell. If your party has access to a lot of other Counter Spells, you don't have to do this because this character is slightly worse at Counter Spelling since we won't get max level spell slots. Um, compared to other characters, but Counterspell is just such a powerful effect, and this character also doesn't currently have a great use for your reaction, and it's important to have a use for every resource you have every turn of combat. Um, this is something I say a lot, but every character has access to five resources every turn of combat. Your action, bonus action, reaction, movement, and concentration. We have great uses for four of these up till now, but don't really have a great use for our reaction, and so um, having Counterspell gives us an incredible reaction spell as well, and we can replace our default concentration of Cloud of Daggers with Hunger of Hadar, which is just an incredible spell overall. Alright, we've now made it to the peak of our Warlock levels, and can go back to taking levels in Bard. First off, this gives us access to Song of Rest, which is incredible for a Warlock. This is just an extra use of all of your spells every day, or extra two spells every day, which is great. This is going to be an extra two of your highest level spell slots every single day, thanks to Warlock spells refreshing on short rest, and Song of Rest giving you an extra short rest. So for our spell selection here, we are going to take... Uh, if we haven't selected it already, Tasha's Hideous Laughter. We're now at the point in the game where we should have access to the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel fairly soon, and so we can start picking up the powerful illusion and enchantment spells that we'll be able to cast as a bonus action. Band of the Mystic Scoundrel lets you cast a, an illusion or enchantment spell as a bonus action after you have... Uh, struck with a weapon attack, Tasha's Hideous Laughter is an enchantment spell that disables an enemy for the rest of the fight, so it's great to have access to this spell. This, of course, does take your concentration, but there aren't a lot of other spells that you're going to need. If you really feel like you will never cast this, you could pick up Thunder Wave as a panic button, but it's really good to have access to this spell. At Bard level 3, we get to take our subclass, and of course we're going to take Swords Bard. This uh, gives us access to all of these slashing flourishes, or all of these bardic flourishes, all three of which are great for this character. This character does sometimes struggle with its defenses, but since we'll have good, since the HP is relatively low, but since we'll have great AC um, for since we'll be in, in medium armor with a shield and decent dexterity, we can make ourselves extremely hard to hit with Defensive Flourish. Slashing Flourish, of course, just lets us hit two enemies, which is incredible, just doubles your damage output with that attack. And Mobile Flourish, pushing your enemy back to, uh, 20 feet, is extremely useful for the same reason Repelling Blast is so useful. You can punt enemies back into your Hunger of Hadars once they've left them, uh, forcing them to re-engage with the damaging spell effects that you have been able to push them out of, or that they've been able to escape. Um, all three of these melee flourishes are extremely useful. Their ranged versions are also not totally useless, though mostly you'll be attacking with range at range with Eldritch Blasts. You probably will have a ranged weapon equipped, and sometimes you can just use a ranged flourish to gain a little extra value. 
For our level 2 spell selection, again, we're looking for powerful illusions and enchantments that we can bonus action cast, and so I'm going to recommend Hold Person. Hold Person's also incredible for this character, even if you aren't using the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel, because you can just cast this before starting combat, and then you get automatic critical hits with your weapon attacks. Uh, as You can cast this as your way of starting combat, and then you get automatic critical hits. Since this character does so much damage, it is going to do... Um, it's going to be excellent to be able to hold an enemy still and get automatic critical hits. You benefit a ton from that. For our fighting style, of course, here we're going to take dueling. This lets us use a one-handed weapon and shield and do extra damage, which is great. Bard level 4, we get another feat. And since we're so charisma dependent, of course, the feat we're going to take is to boost our charisma. You can get your charisma up to 24 with certain items and story events in the game, and that is a ridiculously high amount of charisma um, that is going to make your character hit with plus seven and have ridiculously hard to resist spells. So you will be doing more damage than any other character because of your very high base stats and have harder to resist spells than any other character because charisma is easier to raise to ridiculously high levels than any other stat except strength. For our spell selection here, you probably still do want Cloud of Daggers somewhere in the build, so you could pick that back up. You could also take Silence. Um, you could take Enhance Ability if you are worried about passing certain skill, skill checks in Act 3. So any of those is great to have access to. Um, this is going to be less a core component of your build and more something that you feel you need. And so I recommend using this to fill a hole in your build that you are feeling the lack of, whether that be AoE damage or passing certain skill checks, or dealing with spellcasters. All three of those are, are good options. As a good default, though, just having Cloud of Daggers is never bad. For a cantrip selection, we take whichever cantrip we feel like we need in our party. Um, presumably, you have Minor Illusion and Mage Hand from other party members, but more Mage Hands is always good, so we can take that. Bard level 5 gets us Font of Inspiration, meaning that our Inspiration dice now come back on a short rest, which means we can now, we're now almost entirely short rest dependent. We do have Bardic uh, spell slots, but a lot of our high level spells and our best spells are being cast with Warlock spell slots, and so we can now make our special melee attacks with uh, slashing flourishes, and etc., on short rest cooldowns, and our spells are on short rest cooldowns, making this character extremely sustainable and very on, uh, very short rest dependent rather than long rest dependent. So you'll be able to have very long adventuring days with this character as well. We also get level 3 spells here, and we're going to pick up... Um, I'm actually going to suggest picking up uh, Glyph of Warding here. We will be concentrating very frequently on Hunger of Hadar rather than one of these other level 3 disable spells. Although it's great to have all of these, having a non-concentration option is pretty good, though Fear and Hypnotic Pattern are both incredible spells that you will not be sad to take either. We could also replace something like Cloud of Daggers or, at this point, Dissonant Whispers, which is probably not seeing much use. We could replace with um, one of the other spells. Uh, one of those other spells. Both Fear and Hypnotic Pattern are incredible disable spells, so we could we could s swap that out if you're no longer using Dissonant Whispers at this point in the game. Deal definitely use both of those spells. At character level 11, the build actually splits depending on what difficulty setting you're playing on. The reason for this is that on Honor Mode, the Warlock level 5 extra attack from your, your Blade Pact and the Bard extra attack from your Bardic, from your Swords Bard extra attack don't stack. So you would still only get two extra attacks if we took two more Bard levels. On Tactician or below, they do stack. And so what two remaining levels you take is actually going to defer depending on what difficulty setting you're playing on. I'll show you the honor mode build first, and then we'll come back to the tactician or below build. Um, but let's let's just jump into the honor mode build, where you'll be taking two more levels of warlock. Since you only get two attacks with this build, we just take additional levels of warlock. This gets us fourth level warlock spell slots, which is great because those will come back on a on a short rest. Um, so that'll give us a little bit more spellcasting power compared to taking two extra bard levels. For our spell selection at level 11, we are therefore going to take whatever control spell we didn't take from our bard level, so we'll pick up Fear here. Now we have all of the best control spells in the game. Fear, Hypnotic Pattern, and Hunger of Hadar together give you 
basically all the best things to concentrate on in combat, and you get to choose which of those you want to use in a given combat, depending on which is most effective. All three of them have their place, and one thing that I say a lot in terms of spell selection is don't be afraid to take a lot of different concentration spells, because it's more important to have the perfect spell for the encounter than it is to um, be able to use a slightly suboptimal spell and another spell. You'd rather spend one spell to completely solve an encounter than concentrate on something less good and then spend a second spell, and therefore you've spent more resources on the encounter. Spellcasters are all about having versatility, so it's ideal to have just the best option for every possible encounter. Don't be afraid to take several different concentration spells on the same character. Finally, at Warlock level 7, we get access to 4th level Warlock spells, and continuing our theme of taking the concentration spells that by themselves solve an encounter, we can take Wall of Fire, and for our Eldritch Invocation, we could actually take Dreadful Word, getting access to Confusion, which is a very another very powerful debuff, although somewhat, um, somewhat redundant with the other control spells that we have, like Hypnotic Pattern. But if you're finding that you are unable to target Hypnotic Pattern easily because enemies are, are your allies are getting in the way, Confusion doesn't hit allies, so Dreadful Word gives you access to another very powerful spell. Um, other than that, you could take mostly for flavor. There are not that many powerful options from the Warlock Invocations at this level. We've already got all the best ones. So just getting access to yet another spell that can sometimes solve an encounter by itself, I think, is the best use of your Warlock spell slot. That's the Honor Mode build. I'm now going to just quickly reload a save, and we will talk about the Tactician or Below build. On Tactician Mode or lower difficulty settings, the extra attacks do stack, so taking a second level, another level of Bard, gets us access to a third attack in a round. Obviously that's incredible, especially because all, our, all of our attacks are based on our Charisma, so they are all hitting for lots of damage, and we're going to get even more damage sources later uh, from our items, so of course the more attacks we hit with, the higher the damage we do is going to be. This is going to be incredible for us, so we'll take our level of Bard, and our, for our spell selection, we will, similarly to the Honor Mode version of the build, take whatever control effect we didn't take at the previous level. And then at Bard level 7, we get access to two cool things. Uh, we could either take Confusion, but something I actually really like to take here is Greater Invisibility. This character will have okay stealth checks, especially if you use the Gloves of Dexterity. And so Greater Invisibility can let you get a couple cheeky hits in before a fight starts. You don't actually have amazing uses for your level 4 spell slot, so this is a, a fun way to just win an encounter, especially if you get Pass Without Trace from an ally. So uh, Confusion is probably the the optimal pick here, but greater invisibility is fun and adds a whole other dimension to this character, so I like grabbing it here myself. You can cast it on yourself and then make a couple attacks before the enemies, as long as you keep passing your stealth check, before the enemies can detect you. For items for this build, well, we get to use the most powerful item combo in Baldur's Gate, one that's so powerful that I personally actually don't recommend using it because I think it, it kind of ruins the game balance by trivializing every encounter that you face, but it would be absolutely remiss of me not to mention how powerful it is to have the Helm of Arcane Acuity on this character. When you're making three attacks per round, you get Arcane Acuity, six turns of Arcane Acuity gives you a plus six bonus to your spell attack rolls, which includes your Eldritch Blast, and your spell save DC, meaning that enemies basically can never succeed on a saving throw against your spells. When you have spells like Hypnotic Pattern, Command, Hold Person, and so on, um, having enemies be unable to succeed on those saves is ridiculously powerful. And you notice that we have been taking... Um, illusion and enchantment spells, well that combines with the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel to allow you to hit an enemy three times in a turn for six stacks of Arcane Acuity, and then cast, for example, a Hold Person, um, causing an enemy to instantly fail the save and become paralyzed with no hope of getting out of it because your Arcane Acuity stacks make your save DCs so high there's just nothing they can do about it. You can even combine that with the Ring of Arcane Synergy, and this is why when you have cantrip damage, you gain Arcane Synergy for two turns, and that gives you additional damage with weapon attacks equal to your spellcasting modifier, so that'll double your Charisma bonus to damage. You can make a weapon attack with uh, your first weapon action, 
and then cast a bonus action mo Vicious Mockery, because it's an enchantment using the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel, um, and then make your next two weapon attacks and every subsequent weapon attack with additional damage from the Arcane Synergy Ring. Those three items together give you an incredible amount of damage and control, and honestly, I think are too powerful a combo for the game, but they are a ridiculously powerful option that this character has access to. For other items for this character, the Gloves of Dexterity are great, as they are for all light or medium armor characters, and any of the medium armors that allow you to add your full dex to the build will be excellent. Potent Robe, of course, is also really good, because it will let you do um, additional damage equal to your Charisma on your Eldritch Blast attacks, as well as on your bonus action Vicious Mockeries. So all of those together are going to be a ridiculous amount of extra damage if you have Potent Robe. So either you want higher AC, or you want Potent Robe to do additional damage on your spell attacks. I recommend just getting the best one-handed weapon you can find, whatever does the most damage, and binding that as your packed weapon. And for your shield, anything that gives you advantage on save DCs, or anything that gives you bonuses on initiative, uh, the Sentinel Shield in particular is excellent, because initiative is one of the points uh, that this character can struggle with not that you're bad at it but you know more is always good and if you go first with this character you'll basically always win the fight so any initiative bonuses you get are excellent all right my friends i hope that you've enjoyed this video and of course as always if you have feel free to leave a comment uh like the video and you can subscribe to my channel for more uh, baldur's gate 3 character builds and other strategy game content and of course if you've really enjoyed this video or any of my previous ones, you can feel free to become a channel member or leave a uh, donation down below using the buttons below the video. Cheers, my friends. I'll catch you next time.